Now I please Professor Somitra Banerjee to introduce our our distinguished speaker Professor Parthapruti Mojumdar and to say few uh, uh, words about him as well as our organization. It is indeed our great pleasure to have Professor Parthapruti Mojumdar with us today. And who could deliver a talk on this year's Nobel Prize in uh, in medicine and what is it? Medicine and physiology, physiology right? Uh, then Professor Parthapruti Mojumdar, because the area in which the Nobel Prize has been awarded this year. Professor Mojumdar works exactly in that area. He is in the thick of things. And so it will be almost like a first hand exposure for us from him. As you know, the Breakthrough Science Society works towards propagation of a scientific bent of mind among the people. And it is also. And it is also our endeavor to popularize the developments in science, to give an exposure to the developments in science. And it is necessary for students of various disciplines to know what is happening, the great developments that are happening in other areas. And so we often invite eminent people like him to give popular talks to expose more or less in a common man's language the great developments are happening today in science and our effort today is directed towards that professor parthapruti majumdar uh, i can say is a luminary in the field of science in india he has been working in ISI Kolkata for a long time, but he was the founder director of the National Institute for Biomedical Genomics in Kolani, with which he still associated. He was formerly the president of uh, Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore. And uh, there are a huge number of awards and laurels. It's difficult for me to read that out. Probably that will not be necessary. Uh, and today, we would like to hear from him the, the great development of science that has happened, which has opened a whole vista in our understanding of the human evolution. Only a few years back, that was unthinkable. Today, we are not only thinking about it, we can learn about it with proper scientific grounding. And this is the work of Professor Pebo, and which Professor Partha Mojumdar is also pursuing. So I now request Professor Partha Mojumdar to start his talk. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Banerjee, for uh, first of all, for asking me to give this talk and for your generous introduction. Um, honestly, when uh, Professor Banerjee asked me to give a talk on uh, this year's Nobel Award in uh, Physiology or Medicine, um, the amount of time that uh, he said I should give this talk for was just too short. I essentially felt that 
um, if I'm going to introduce the subject area in which Savante Pebo worked and his contributions, I needed to contextualize uh, his work. And that's the reason why I thought that I should uh, deliver this talk for a, a longer period of time uh, and not start with uh, his contributions to this particular area. So as I said, that I'm going to contextualize the area in which uh, Savante Pebo works and uh, then highlight the contributions that he has made uh, to, to, to this particular uh, science. I think we need the lights on, at least on the days off. Um, so this, uh, the title of my talk might sound a little enigmatic, uh, but towards the end of my talk, I will make it clear uh, why the title of this talk is apt to describe uh, the work and contributions of Sivante Pebo, uh, who is um, a phenomenon of a person, uh, not just in genetics, but those of us who have had the opportunity to know him uh, as a person, he is uh, singularly funny. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, what am I supposed to do to make it move? Uh, can you... uh, what, this yeah. one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. You can make a wheel. Use this wheel. Use the wheel? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so this is this is of course a narrative of uh, what what he's done and of human evolution. As you can see, this is a very odd place to give this talk from because I can't even read my slides at such an angle. Um, it's going to be really hard um, because I do need to read my slides, otherwise I won't be able to give this talk. Can I open up my laptop and keep it here? As you see this, at least I can see my laptop. Is that a, is that a possibility? Otherwise, uh, uh, this is going to be a failure because I ca cannot see this from this angle. I can't read my. <clears throat> Otherwise, oi khane nii jete hobe. So the reason why he's been awarded the Nobel Prize is uh, uh, his citation states that uh, he got the Nobel Prize for his discoveries concerning the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution. So this is the reason why he's uh, gotten this prize. Uh, it's noteworthy that he got this prize in physiology or medicine. Now, as you can see that uh, the citation does not even use the word physiology or medicine. It talks about extinct hominins and human evolution. So this is, uh, it's noteworthy primarily because this is the first time in the history of Nobel awards that somebody has, an evolutionary biologist is being awarded. I suppose they couldn't find where else they could place him. So they placed him in physiology or medicine. His, his work is uh, uh, stellar in its own right. And he certainly deserves a Nobel prize, but whether it goes to this particular uh, committee or not, one is not sure, but anyways, doesn't, doesn't really matter. He got a Nobel Prize and we, we need to know what he's done and why uh, the Nobel Committee actually chose him to uh, award this prize. Okay, so I'm going to uh, begin my story. Like I said, that I'm going to contextualize it and I'm going to begin my story many, many million years ago. Uh, but I'm also going to jump many million years with uh, every hop. Uh, and so in the, very quickly, I'm going to come to um, us modern humans. So our story begins five to 10 million years ago. That's a large time bracket. And you will see that in most of my slides, 
you will find a large time bracket primarily because the kind of evidence that we use uh, is mostly uh, sometimes fragmentary and mostly using statistical methods in order to make inferences on time. And that's the reason why you find a large standard deviation, primarily because the kind of um, data that we use is not always of a great, uh, great nature in the sense that the sample sizes are not very um, large, et cetera. Uh, however, if we want a point estimate in this interval, we would plug it at about 8 million years. So about 8 million years, and the way to read these graphs would be that these are the currently existing species, chimpanzees, humans, bonobos, and so on and so forth. All of us had a common ancestor many years ago, and that common ancestor existed about 8 million years ago. And about 8 million years ago, we separated two lines of descent separated. One line uh, led to the arrival of the modern humans or evolution of modern humans. The other line of descent came through the gorillas and chimpanzees, and gorillas and chimpanzees exist today. Bonobos then later uh, uh, you know, evolved from that in that particular line of descent, etc. So uh, the major point is that a population of African apes split into two distinct species, and uh, once one uh, line of descent led to the humans, the other line of descent continues and uh, you know, uh, led to the arrival of other species such as bonobos and so on. I'm taking a, a real hop, 4 million years. So I've crossed 4 million years. And about 4 million years ago, uh, one of the species on the evolutionary path to humans uh, became uh, began to spend most of its time on two feet. Prior to that, prior to 4 million years, all of these apes would were uh, quadrupedal. So they would actually um, use uh, all of their limbs, all of their four limbs, in order to walk, in order to move one place to another. About four million years ago, we became a bipedal, and uh, one of the spe one of the genus uh, that that was was is uh, recorded to be the first bipedal genus um, is called Australopithecus. And there are, of course, various species within Australopithecus. Australopithecus afarensis is one of the newer ones. We have Australopithecus anamensis, and so on and so forth. So there are multiple uh, species that evolved within this genus Australopithecus. All of them were bipedal. How do we know where they were bipedal? Of the many kinds of evidence that there are, uh, there is one particular volcanic uh, ash bed um, in Kenya, which is the ash bed is dated to be 3.7 million years, and there are footprints on that ash bed. Um, so whoever walked on that ash bed, on the volcanic ash bed, walked, was, uh, lived about 4 million years ago. And I can't, but people who are um, experts or who have been trained to read these uh, footprints, they can uh, vouch that whoever walked on this volcanic ash bed um, actually uh, was a, had a bipedal gait, walked on two feet. Um, so that's a testimony to bipedal gait. And this was discovered, this ash bed and these footprints were discovered um, by a member of a family that spent generations in Africa fossil hunting and recreating human evolution. And that's the Leakey family. Mary Leakey discovered this uh, fossil bed, uh, a volcanic bed with these footprints in 1975. And this is uh, certainly an up uh, testimony to an upright gate. Uh, again, I'm jumping 2 million years. So from 4 million years, I come to 2 million years when at about 2 million years ago, uh, the genus Homo, to, to which we belong, we are, uh, we are known as Homo sapiens. Um, so this particular genus arose about 2 million years ago. And uh, one of the characteristic features of this particular genus was that uh, we could use stone tools. And there were other concomitant, uh, concomitant characteristic features, such as the skull size and the brain size and so on and so forth, which was greater in size than uh, the contemporary um, um, uh, apes that, that still exist with us today. Um, the, uh, mo another important point that I would like to point out is that this is in Africa and in Homo erectus fossils have been found in Java, which is very far away, geographically very spread, very far away from Africa, about 1.8 million years. So what it means is that we arose, uh, uh, you know, whenever we arose, maybe 2, 2.5 million years ago, but we quickly uh, spread throughout the world. And there was, of course, a lot of controversy about whether there was simultaneous evolution of the genus Homo in multiple parts of the world. Um, and uh, that, that uh, debate raged for a long time. The debate has sort of been settled. And everybody now agrees that we all evolved in Africa and moved out of Africa 
um, even when when our uh, original genus Homo arose, uh, and that was about two million years ago. Um, once the uh, f first species in the genus Homo appeared, it began to spin off new varieties of Homo, new different species. So we have Homo habilis, we have Homo ergaster, we have Homo erectus, uh, we have the Heidelberg man, which is called Homo heidelbergensis. Uh, and I will focus on the Neanderthals. Uh, this is called Homo neanderthalensis. Uh, so this is the Neanderthal man on which uh, Cervantes um, made major contributions or analyzed uh, data of Neanderthals in order to derive um, uh, inferences regarding our past. Uh, and then us, uh, Homo sapiens. So uh, we ar arose, the genus Homo arose about 2 million years ago. And between 2 million years to now, um, uh, there are multiple species in the genus Homo. And as a matter of fact, there are many, many more species. Uh, uh, and uh, the I don't think you can read this. But this is, again, a, a, a reconstruction of our evolution that's known as phylogenetic tree. Uh, essentially, it's rooted somewhere and uh, from these roots, that goes back to many million years ago. There are branches that evolved, and one of the branches com comprise all of these Homo species uh, or species in the genus Homo. And there are now 21 known species uh, in the genus Homo. And we are discovering the latest uh, member of our latest species that we have discovered is called Homo longi, and that's been uh, identified only in 2018. So you see that our, our uh, um, uh, knowledge of human evolution is kind of fragmentary, is kind of scanty, and we are still discovering newer and newer species in the home, uh, genus home. So when, like I said, that it is really like a tree, and we, if we root it about uh, one or two million years ago when Homo erectus was, uh, was uh, uh, reigning the uh, planet or reigning large tracts of Africa, uh, from there multiple species arose, and one of the species is called Homo heidelbergensis. Then we have the Neanderthals and the Denisovans and the Sapiens. And essentially, I'm going to talk about these three uh, species uh, because uh, most of our talk today uh, centers around these three species. Uh, that's, uh, that's the Heidelberg man that uh, looks almost like us, as you can see, but not quite, but looks almost like us. And uh, the Heidelberg man arose, or from the Heidelberg man, newer branches, um, uh, you know, uh, grew and those branches led to the Neanderthal man and the Denisovans and so on. And that happened between 300 and 400,000 years ago. Uh, when did the humans arrive? Humans again arrive, uh, uh, was branched off from this particular uh, big branch of the tree. And we arrived between 150,000 years and, uh, uh, and 100,000 years. So let's say about 125, 30,000 years ago, we arose. Uh, but we were uh, two separate branches. The branch that gave rise to the Neanderthals and Denisovans was separate from the branch that gave rise to us. So obviously, one quick question arises. Uh, what, what, what was the relationship between uh, the, the Homo sapiens, Denisovans, and Neanderthals? Because we were uh, so close to each other in terms of evolutionary time uh, and, and space. And space came later. We got to know about evolutionary space much later. But evolutionary time, um, what was the relationship? Um, we also know that the Neanderthals uh, became extinct. Uh, the, the, the knowledge of Denisovans did not exist at that time when uh, people started asking the question, uh, how and why did the Neanderthals vanish? And the popular, uh, popular hypothesis was that, you know, we were powerful tool users. So we probably clubbed their heads and beat them to death. And we beat them, beat many of them to death, and therefore they uh, they became extinct. Whether or not that's the true hypothesis, we would uh, uh, was being questioned and challenged. And that's when uh, you know Cervantes Pepebo appeared on the scene, and he said that this is an important question, and we should try and resolve this question. Why? What was the relationship among these three separate species, and uh, why did the Neanderthals become extinct? That's where he made most of his contributions. But uh, again, I, I need to provide the context of this um, in, in, a, in a detailed way. As we spoke, as we spoke, as I narrated to you uh, how we have reconstructed human evolution, etc., or what have been the major inferences, most of these uh, inferences, uh, you know, millions of years ago, were primarily from fossil bones. Now, when you discover a fossil, most of it is very fragmentary, very scanty evidence. 
you get a broken bone or a broken piece of skull and so on and so forth. And then you try and piece together human evolution by comparative uh, by comparison with other kinds of skull fossils, uh, again, in terms of you know broken skulls or broken bones. Uh, it is good evidence. It is certainly good evidence, especially paleontologists who have been actually uh, taught to read these kinds of uh, bones and try to make comparative um, uh, you know, comparisons between the bones and infer whether they belong to the same species or not. Certainly, that's uh, a lot of good science that was practiced, but it is based on very fragmentary evidence. One of the evidence that's more, uh, more foolproof, more objective, is if we can find a DNA. Now, DNA in, in us, uh, well, in different species, it is of a different length, but the basic structure is by and large the same. The length may be different, but the basic structure is by and large the same. It's In us, it's about 3 billion nucleotides, 3 billion alphabets, linearly arranged. And uh, that, that's what provides us with our individuality and uh, you know, the way that we behave. The, the kind of diseases that we are susceptible to. Uh, the question arises then if we have 3 billion nucleotides and uh, each one of us has 3 billion nucleotides, are the nucleotide sequences exactly the same? The answer is no, it's 99.9% .9 similar, but uh, that 1%, 0.1% dissimilarity actually uh, translates to about 3 billion alphabets. Of these uh, 3 billion alphabets, about 3 million alphabets to be different. And these three, the difference in three million alphabets between any two of us on an average, uh, three million alphabets, actually gives us our individuality. Uh, you know, makes one person resistant to disease, uh, another person susceptible to the same disease, etc. So these in inter individual differences is because of this small amount of difference that we find in our DNA. Uh, and and uh, then we try to compare these DNA sequences and try and draw inferences using statistical methods, try and draw inferences about the relationships among these uh, DNA sequences. And once we draw the relationships among these DNA sequences, um, there will be subsets of DNA sequences that are confined to a particular species. And then we are able to make connections between species using relationships among DNA sequences. So this is our bread and butter. This is what we do. We try and sequence the DNA that that's usually in the most of which is embedded in the nucleus of a cell. Uh, we are able to now sequence the nucleotides, uh, the uh, three billion nucleotides, and are able to analyze it and uh, compare it and then draw uh, inferences using statistical methods. So it's a combination of technology and statistics. Well, if you can, you can think of, uh, of statistics also as a technology using uh, major technological feats in order to draw scientific inferences. Now, the question is that if you're going to compare our DNA, meaning modern human DNA with Neanderthal DNA, we need uh, to isolate DNA from the Neanderthals. And the Neanderthals actually became extinct about 30, 40,000 years ago. And all that we have of the Neanderthals is like, you know, what I said, a broken bone, a piece of broken skull, uh, etc. And uh, because they, were, they are so old, uh, how would you even be able to uh, isolate DNA from them? Because you would only have a, a um, speck of muscle or a little bit of a bone powder, etc. Uh, and, and that's really uh, very difficult. The other difficulty, as you can imagine, that uh, when you leave a carcass you know, out in the open, there will be bacterial growth and fungal growth and all of that. So if you try and isolate DNA from a bone, you would mostly be isolating a bacterial DNA and fungal DNA. Uh, the uh, original uh, member to which it belongs, which is the Neanderthal or whatever ancient um, uh, you know, human you're trying to sequence, you would hardly get any um, DNA from that, that portion of uh, the, the, the pool of DNA that you have isolated from that bone. Uh, how do you then weed out the bacterial DNA and the fungal DNA and only concentrate on the other DNA that belongs to this ancient bone? Uh, it was it was. A horrendous task. I will not get into the details, but I will tell you a few key steps that Sivan uh, um, Pebo and his team had to overcome in order to be able to uh, take these, uh, you know, uh, Neanderthal um, pieces uh, of bones and then isolate uh, DNA from there, and then be able to recreate that DNA by get eliminating the fungal and the bacterial, and then um, you know, piecing them together and comparing it. Uh, between among the Neanderthals and also uh, the Neanderthal DNA with the human DNA.
So that was that was a major chore, and uh, it wasn't easy at all. Uh, I have said these, and uh, so how do these variations come about? Like I said, that we are about 0.1 percent different, but how do these differences come about? They come about in two ways. Uh, those of you who are biologists, you can turn your mind off. Uh, you you already know all of this. So uh, the the way that it happens is that uh, there are uh, mechanisms when our DNA makes copies of itself and it needs to make copies of itself primarily because there is cellular growth and so on and so forth. It makes copies of itself. And in any copying process, even if you're trying to copy a line from a book uh, and write down that line, you would make some errors. So similarly, biological copying mechanisms also are error prone. But there are also correction mechanisms, right? You write a line from a, you have read a line from a textbook, you have written that line. Uh, you want to know whether you have written that line correctly. You read it one more time and find out that, well, I made this mistake. So you have correction mechanisms. Similarly, in biology, in biological processes, there are correction mechanisms. And these correction mechanisms usually are able to correct most of the errors. But they are not always able to correct 100% of all of the errors. And therefore, some errors remain. And errors that remain, if those, those cells get passed on from parents to offspring, Along those, uh, if those those cells have these errors, then those errors will get transmitted from the parents to the offspring. So that's the re that's how the errors would propagate uh, from one generation to another. The next generation also will accumulate some more errors, and that will again transmit to the uh, generation after that. And so, what happens over a period of time is that. These errors, these errors are called mutations or DNA variants, whatever. Uh, these errors um, accumulate in the genomes, and that's what essentially gives us uh, these differences of 0.1% that we uh, have in our uh, DNAs. Um, these errors happen more when we are exposed to certain kinds of uh, environment. Of course, there are correction mechanisms, but there are also uh, an impact of the environment, uh, including rays of the sun, the ultraviolet rays of the sun, exposure to tobacco smoke, they are mutagens. Uh, so there are multiple kinds of agents, environmental, physical, and chemical agents that actually cause changes in the DNA. Again, they can get corrected, but sometimes the correction mechanisms fail. Uh, and those that fail, some of them actually are passed on from that, um, from one generation to another generation. That's how, um, uh, you know, the, what happens is that that's how these uh, kinds of DNA variations among a group of individuals accumulate. The other point that I want to make is that you can imagine that if you have a, a bunch of people who have lived for a very long time, for many generations, you would expect that in the contemporary generations, there will be a large amount of variation among people or the diversity among those people would be larger than another population that has evolved a shorter time ago. So as the length of time increases, length of evolutionary time increases, one would expect that there will be more and more diversity among individuals, individuals belonging to that population. If you turn the coin the other way around, if I observe that, an, that a population is hugely diverse compared to, let's say, another population, I can infer, and it's not preposterous to make this inf inference, I can infer that the one that has the higher amount of genetic diversity is the one that's an older population. So we, we look uh, in, in, in this kind of, in our kind of enterprise, we look forward, but then we turn the logic backward in order to draw inferences about a human evolution. So this is exactly what we do. And I'll use these two um, kinds of logic in, in uh, recreating human evolution as we go on. Um, so I, I, I've actually said many of these. You don't really have to uh, read all of this. I've said what I needed to say. That's uh, enshrined in these uh, various lines. All right. So, um, yeah. So the, 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 uh, using this kind of logic and using trying to understand how much of diversity there is among individuals who belong to a particular population group or in a particular region where they um, uh, where they're resident, um, the inference is that we evolved in Africa. And the reason why we draw this inference is that uh, however you measure um, the genetic diversity, and there are many ways of measuring genetic diversity. I'm not going to get into uh, technicalities now. On the y-axis is a measure of genetic diversity. And as you can see, that uh, the measure of uh, genetic diversity in Africa is the la largest, uh, uh, followed by uh, genetic diversity in Asia, 
and then the other um, parts of the world, uh, uh, Europe, Australia, etc., they are far smaller than either Europe or Asia. So the inference is that our um, um, we evolved in Africa, and however we came to Asia, or uh, you know, we we uh, started living in Asia. Uh, we also have a very large amount of genetic diversity among population groups in Asia, which essentially means that those populations are also fairly old compared to other populations in Europe <coughs> um, and, and other such places. Uh, if you do it, uh, if you compare DNA sequences also, essentially it's the same. Um, uh, African populations, the diversity of African populations are on the um, uh, are higher than populations in other parts of the world. So the inference from all of these genetic diversity studies is that we evolved in Africa, but we evolved in Africa and then did what is the question. I'll produce another uh, piece of evidence that will actually build the story to what did we do after we evolved in Africa. So if you look at these, uh, these uh, numbers, the, or these symbols, uh, the color-coded uh, rectangles and the labels on the top, uh, these are uh, these are signatures. These are genomic signatures. Uh, essentially, it's a combination of um, uh, of nucleotides. It's a combination of alphabets, specific combinations of alphabets. And if you get specific combinations of alphabets, just as by comparing DNA sequences, we can understand or we can um, statistically infer which DNA sequence is older than which other DNA sequences. Similarly, we can date these different kinds of signatures. A very unimaginative way of naming the signatures, A, B, C, D, etc. And uh, these are color coded. And the ones that are on the left hand side are the ones that are older because they belong to the older branches of this phylogenetic tree of genetic signatures. Uh, the ones to the right are the ones that have evolved um, after those signatures have evolved or from those signatures. Now, if you look at uh, hum human populations resident all over the world, and if we ask ourselves, what kind of signatures do, do we get in these different regions? This is what the picture pans out to be. Uh, um, what we see uh, is that it's, it's, a, it's a slightly complicated. Each pi, pi diagram actually is um, uh, relative frequencies of these various kinds of signatures. Um, it's color coded, so it's easy to read. I won't let you, uh, you know, take you through the, all of the colors and all, everything else. Um, um, in, in detail, but what, uh, what suffices is that if you look at Africa, you find that these are the signatures that are the oldest signatures are in Africa. If you look at the New World, uh, where uh, which was populated because humankind crossed the Bering Strait between 15 and 20,000 years ago and went and peopled the New World, which is the Americas, you find that most of the newer signatures are in the New World. You don't find the older signatures. So and and um, the uh, Middle East, India, and all of these places comprise a, a diversity of signatures that are all, that all belong to the Middle Ages. The inference is that humankind evolved in Africa, and we moved out of Africa uh, to essentially populate Europe, India, Middle East, etc., and then moved on to populate the New World, and therefore the newest kinds of signatures are what's found here. This is, these are Y chromosomal signatures and these are patternally transmitted signatures. So that's what it is. So using Y chromosomal genetic signatures, we, it's consistent with uh, the, uh, the, the fact that, or with the evidence that humans evolved in Africa and it's, uh, it builds up the story that we probably moved out of Africa and started peopling other parts of the world. There is also extra nuclear DNA that's outside of the nucleus. It's called mitochondrial DNA which is a short piece of DNA, but even in that short piece, we find uh, signatures. And if you look at maternal DNA signatures, again, these are uh, from left to right. The left one, uh, signatures are the oldest, the right signatures are the newest. They are color coded and you find exactly the same feature. The oldest ones are in Africa, uh, very diverse in the Middle East, India, and these kinds of places, Asia and Europe mostly. And in the new world, you find the newest newest signatures uh, predominant in the, in, in um, the new world. So this is uh, again consistent with the uh, with the theory that humans evolved in Africa, moved out of Africa. We first, uh, you know, went and people went and people um, uh, Asia and other such places, and then moved on to people the new world. Um, so this this is this is what we know of modern humans. Modern humans uh, meaning Homo sapiens, and uh, this has been done 
using DNA sequences from contemporary human population. Uh, to, to, uh, so, uh, we, uh, like I said, that uh, you know, modern humans arose in Africa. When did the modern humans arise in Africa? Uh, we can again look at the DNA sequences and they date back to about 150,000 years ago. Uh, the, the DNA sequences that belong to the modern humans can be dated to about 150,000 years ago. Give or take 20, 30,000 years, but about that time. So we evolved in Africa uh, um, in about 150,000 years ago. And there are, again, uh, the leaky family, etc. Uh, they, they identified these skulls and they have been also dated to about 130,000 years. <clears throat> Um, so we, we uh, look at Africa and we started moving out of Africa and these are the various migration trails that we followed and by and large you don't have to concentrate on this, by and large is what, what, what I've already told you, we uh, populated Asia and Europe and then moved on to populate the new world which is uh, which are the Americas. When we came out of Africa, did we meet any of our relatives, did we meet any cousins that looked like us and or was close to us? The answer is yes. We actually met several other species, and we uh, we were convinced that we were not alone. So we came out of Africa and met species like this. Uh, many of them were, of course, Neanderthals because Neanderthals did exist at that time. And uh, uh, and and uh, if we um, uh, the predominantly there were two 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 different kinds of cousins that we met. Uh, among others, the others I'm not getting into uh, into any detail because they were. Uh, very small in number, and they became extinct at some points of time whose DNA sequences have not uh, been possible to identify and to sequence. But I will talk about these, uh, the other, other kind of species as well. So we met two other species of uh, hominids, of uh, our cousins in the Eurasian landmass. One is predominantly the Neanderthals, so we met the Neanderthals, and the other and the other is called the Denisovans, and the Denisova is a cave in Siberia where a small finger bone was found, and that finger bone uh, provided us with some DNA which could be sequenced. And when you compared the sequence of the finger bone, um, uh, compared it to the Neanderthal DNA sequence, it was uh, pretty convincing evidence that the Denisovans and the Neanderthals were two separate species. So these are the two major species that we met once we came out of Africa. Uh, and, and like I said, that uh, the Neanderthals uh, existed for almost half a million years in Europe and uh, Western Asia, but they disappeared about between 30 and 40,000 years ago. Uh, and uh, the questions that remain, the question that, um, you know, confronted many evolutionary biologists um, uh, before Sivante Pebo was able to solve the puzzle, um, is that their history and relationship their meaning the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, their history and relationship uh, to uh, modern humans, in other words, the relationship between the archaic humans and the modern humans were unclear. Um, and uh, uh, they became extinct, the Neanderthals became extinct, and therefore uh, the dominant uh, proposal was that we exterminated them uh, incident because we were good tool users. Incidentally, I must also mention that Neanderthals knew how to make stone tools. Uh, yet we, uh, the dominant theory was that we exterminated them, and uh, the second theory that uh, also prevailed is that Neanderthals are not direct ancestors of the present-day Europeans, and I'll explain this uh, in a few minutes as I go along. That was another dominant theme. Both were um, actually uh, proven uh, to be false, uh, and the main uh, team that proved this was led by uh, Cervante Pebo. So uh, here is Sivante Pebo, and he's, of course, uh, gotten the Nobel Prize for his discoveries concerning the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution. Um, so he was able to, like I said, that he was able to extract uh, DNA from these uh, uh, you know, fossil bones and was able to actually sequence that DNA, but it was not an easy chore. Um, it's easy to sequence, uh, you know, take a sample of my blood, uh, isolate DNA and sequence that. That's become easy. But uh, because of various other reasons, it wasn't easy uh, to isolate DNA and to be able to sequence DNA from uh, these archaic humans. Um, the first one that he encountered or he was, he was successful in sequencing came from this gray cave in Croatia, 
which is near the, because this is Croatia, near the Adriatic, and this is called the Vinya Cave. Um, this particular cave provided a fossil specimen uh, that he was able to again isolate DNA from. And uh, these are the bone fragments. It was published in Science, cover of Science. Um, they provided some bone fragments. The bone fragments were about 40,000 years old. Uh, and uh, they were able to, uh, Sivante and his team were able to uh, isolate DNA from that bone to generate a draft sequence. Why is it called a draft sequence? Because it was still incomplete. It was only done in bits and pieces and not the complete DNA sequence of the Neanderthals. Why was it not complete? Why is it so difficult? Some of which I have alluded to. Um, first of all, it's not very well preserved. It's, un, um, it's exposed to the vagaries of the weather, uh, vagaries of sunlight, vagaries of other kinds of um, uh, you know, pathogens and other kinds of microbes that infest on these carcasses. Uh, so uh, the DNA, because of all of these exposures, actually gets hugely fragmented. And once it gets very fragmented, it becomes very, very difficult to um, sequence those uh, you know, small pieces of DNA. Won't get into more details of this. Um, there is there's also an over-representation of false over-representation of some alphabets. And that false over-representation is because of certain chemical changes that take place. Again, something that I will not get into. Uh, the other is that there are certain blockers because of this vagaries of exposure, etc. There are some DNA modifications that take place. And because of these modifications, sequencing becomes almost an impossibility. So this prevents amplification and sequencing. By the way, uh, uh, the DNA that we isolate from a, a fossil or even from us uh, is so small that we can't directly sequence it. We need larger amounts of that DNA. And to be able to uh, manufacture larger amounts, it's done artificially by a process called polymerase chain reaction. And the person who actually uh, uh, discovered or invented uh, polymerase chain reaction also got a Nobel Prize. His name is Kari, uh, Kerry Mullis. Uh, but these kinds of blocking lesions actually prevent the amplification of DNA. And if you cannot amplify DNA, it becomes all impossible to actually sequence the DNA. The uh, uh, another major reason is like uh, you know miscoding. Uh, there there is false incorporation of certain amplification, certain nucleotides during amplification. Again, because of chemical changes. So all of these had to be these problems had to be overcome before you could sequence the first Neanderthal DNA. And it's really really an enormous task that uh, he overcame. Uh, this contam contamination with exogenous DNA, like I already mentioned that these are the, the exogenous DNA is like the bacterial DNA and the fungal DNA. And you have to eliminate all of that. Otherwise, you would be only producing uh, sequences of bacterial or fungal DNA. But that's not that's really not what you want to do. Uh, uh, there is uh, yet another uh, big problem, which is called racemization. Racem when amino acids uh, you know, live within us, uh, when we have amino acids, uh, which are encoded by the DNA, and these are uh, these are available in two forms, left-handed form and right-handed form. Uh, when they're outside of the body, not doing any physiological processes, there is conversion from one form to another. Ultimately, if you leave it for a long time, you get 50-50 of, of two kinds, left-handed and uh, right-handed. But because of certain uh, chemical processes, if you take ancient DNA and if you try to uh, identify, uh, you know, because of the changes in the amino acid, if you try and sequence, then you get false sequences because the, the, those kinds of chemical changes have already taken place and racemization is a major problem in uh, sequencing of the ancient DNA. What does it boil down to? It boils down to the fact that even if we aspire to sequence the DNA, it becomes an enormously difficult chore to be able to isolate DNA, to be able to clean up the DNA, to be able to sequence the DNA. All of these needed to be overcome, and Sivante Pebo painstakingly, with a great amount of patience, for over several decades, actually did this and was able to uh, sequence ancient DNA. Um, the other thing that he did, <coughs> having been able to uh, successfully sequence DNA, he was also able to find uh, certain specific uh, um, you know, points in uh, genomes that don't belong to us. Uh, essentially, he was able to identify certain genomic signatures of the Neanderthals that do not belong to us. And because he was able to identify those specific signatures, he could also try and answer the question, 
did did we get any portion of our dna from the neanderthals for that he needed to uh, identify these specific spots in the neanderthal dna which did not uh, which did not match with the humans but uh, later as we'll see they were contributed to the human dna and that's how we know that uh, there was um, uh, well i won't give away the story right now okay so those are uh, that neanderthal dna and those red spots belong to the neanderthals we also find red spots in some of the humans these are all human pieces the blue ones uh, and uh, and these are variant positions in the human dna but there are a, a few humans who also have these specific positions uh, that that actually belong to the neanderthals and they they also are available in some human dna why is it so and what's the interpretation of this will come to in a minute so he was able to uh, um, uh, produce the draft sequence of the neanderthal genome uh, and that was in 2010 uh, that was the first draft sequence of the neanderthal genome that was uh, uh, that that uh, he was able to produce um, he also was able to compare the neanderthal genome with the human genome and uh, obtain some uh, very useful inferences number one neanderthals are cl closer to non africans than to africans and the reason is because the neanderthals the uh, predecessors ancestors of the neanderthals uh, left africa about half a million years ago and they were mostly in europe and asia uh, and therefore uh, they were they are more close to uh, non africans than to africans why did this happen that was only an, uh, only a piece of observation that their genomes are closer to non african genomes than to african genomes uh one reason is because they left africa a long time ago but why are they closer to non africans than to africans we never know for sure so that needed an explanation and we'll come to that explanation uh, very soon the direction of gene flow so there was a uh, admixture there is interbreeding there is a, a direction of gene flow and he was able to show using those specific uh, red spots in the neanderthal genome that were available in some humans but not the other way around you couldn't get the human specific dna spots in the neanderthal genome meaning you couldn't get the blue spots in the neanderthal genome but you did get the red neanderthal spots in the human genome that essentially meant that uh, the direction of gene flow uh, was the uh, was from the neanderthal to the human but not the other way around the third evidence the, the, the third inference that was uh, um, that he drew in this particular paper is that segments of neanderthal ancestry in the non african genomes could be identified and uh, the third uh, and the last uh, thing that he did uh, is that he compared this one draft genome and this was again um, a, a little premature because using a sample of size 1 you are comparing with uh, by then several thousand uh, human genomes that are already available but then uh, he uh, you know uh, used that uh, data in order to estimate the amount of neanderthal ancestry in the humans um because neanderthal genomes had interbred into the humans because of interbreeding and the extent of neanderthal admixture was between 1 and 4% it's very interesting that even with the sample size one when he drew this uh, inference that inference has held up even after we have uh, sequenced more than 1000 neanderthal genomes so that's very very interesting uh so gene uh, essentially dna evidence is very hard evidence and that's the reason why the estimates are very fairly stable even if it's fragmentary the complete genome sequence was then uh, was uh, uh, done in 2014 4 years later it took them uh, again a lot of doing in order to get a complete genome sequence from the draft sequence and then there was no looking back the methods have been all uh, perfected we know how to clean up we know how to amplify we know how to sequence ancient genome Uh, and and all of that credit goes to um, uh, primarily to Svante Pebo. Uh, at some point of time, when you're trying to do this and you repeatedly face failures, you become frustrated. And he expressed Svante expressed frustration. And I'll read out two such sentences. Uh, he said that we'll never be able to sequence the nuclear genome of a Neanderthal. Um, it's too degraded. i've already said that uh, these dna pieces when exposed to the vagaries of the weather and other such kinds of things they get degraded they get fragmented they get infested by bacteria viruses uh, um, uh, fungi and so on and so forth also the amount of dna that you can extract from these frag bone fragments and skull fragments is just too little uh, there's too little dna there it can't be done so this is sivante pebo this year's uh, nobel laureate who actually made these statements out of frustration after he tried 
for years to identify or isolate uh, ancient DNA. Then he says something that we must all uh, learn from. He says, of course, you should never say these things, never say things like that, particularly in biology, because he'll often be overtaken by technical developments. And indeed, he was one of the persons who actually uh, was uh, you know, fundamental to uh, develop these kinds of technical developments. So he was a prime mover of these uh, technical developments. And this is in 2014, 2015, when he was giving a named lecture at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And uh, um, this is, this is uh, a, a year after uh, the complete genome sequence of the Neanderthals was published. How many ancient genomes have we, how many Neanderthal genomes have we actually uh, sequenced so far? Over 8,000. Where did they come from? As you can see, they come primarily from Asia, uh, primarily from Europe, uh, some from, the, uh, from uh, North America, South America as well, but almost nothing from places like India, um, you know, the Middle East, etc. And the reason why it, it's mostly, it mostly comes from Europe is because uh, Europe is like a cold storage, right? Uh, so uh, if you put muscle in the cold storage, the muscle meat in the cold storage, it uh, survives for a very long time. It doesn't get degraded. Uh, but in places like India, where many people have been trying to uh, isolate ancient DNA from uh, whatever fossil remains that we have, it's been almost impossible, primarily because of degradation, uh, again, um, vag vagaries of the weather, and also contamination with other uh, other uh, microbes. So that's that's the Denise Oman cave that I showed you, and uh, a little finger bone was found. Uh, it was sequenced, and it was found that this sequence does not match with the Neanderthals. It could not even have been derived from the Neanderthals, doesn't match with the humans, could not have been derived from the humans, and that then it was declared as a separate species, and that species has been uh, named as Denisovans after uh, the name of the cave, which is Denisova. And uh, the, the, the uh, group actually identified the genetic history of another archaic hominin from this particular cave in Siberia. Uh, they have an evolutionary history which is distinct from the Neanderthals and the modern, uh, modern humans. Um, I've said most of these things that, uh, you know, they're, they're, there was a common ancestor and they lived a, a long time ago, etc. They moved to uh, Eurasia. Uh, modern humans arose in Africa about 150,000 years ago. We started spread moving out of Africa about 100,000 years ago. Again, probably pressure on natural resources and our inquisitiveness to explore. Uh, we came out of Africa. We uh, went places. We went to the Middle East. One of the first places that we came to after we moved out of Africa is India. So we have a very high genetic diversity among populations of India. Um, we reached the New, uh, Near East sometime between sometime about 50 or 60,000 years ago. Um, and we started to mix with the Neanderthals, primarily, predominantly somewhere in the Middle East before continuing through um, Europe and other parts of Asia. Uh, we also mixed with the Denisovans in Southeast Asia and continued on to the Pacific. Um, so we do have some uh, admixture with the Denisovans in the Pacific. And as a matter of fact, the extent of admixture with population groups of uh, uh, Pacific with the Denisovans is higher than uh, those in um, Europe, for example. Um, but then the Neanderthals and Denisovans became extinct. But they live on because, like I said, that uh, specific signatures in the Neanderthal genomes have been identified. Similarly, specific signatures in the Denisovan genome were identified. And uh, then these three species lived in the same geographical region. One of the things that they probably did was to interbreed, as a result of which Neanderthal genomes came into human genomes because we do find Neanderthal genetic signatures in the human genome. The extent of admixture was about 1% to 2% of um, you know, modern humans of non-African ancestry and about 7% of people uh, in Melanesia. So as you can see that these archaic hominins did contribute their DNA to us, and uh, uh, the extent of uh, DNA that they have contributed varies from one uh, region of the world to another region of the world. And, and the variation is quite large from... 1% to 2% to about 7% uh, in the people of Melanesia. The, um, uh, okay, so I, I'm not going to read this. I'm also not going to explain this. This is also very interesting. But what I want to point out is that 25% of these signatures, they're also called haplotypes, 25% of these signatures uh, that, that, that are nonspecific, that have been identified, actually do not identify in the humans. 
actually do not match either with the Denisovans or with the Neanderthals. So uh, they probably are derived from an as yet unknown archaic hominin which essentially means that there were other species of humans who were with whom we were interbreeding, but those fossils have not been found. Their DNA sequences have not been sequenced, and therefore we do not know how many more um, other species that we mated with. Uh, we do have evidence about the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Um, we have been interested in human evolution for a very long period of time, um, and, and we've been uh, working in um, you know, among population groups of India and elsewhere. Uh, so I will just provide you with uh, two interesting uh, observations that we made from our own data. We were working uh, in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, uh, specifically among the Jarwas and the Ongis. These are two tribal populations in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Look uh, very African, very dark, uh, frizzly hair, and so on and so forth. Uh, morphologically very African, and so they they all they always had a lot of interest uh, uh, about, uh, you know, why um, they look so different from us. Um, essentially, we identified, we got some blood samples from them, I isolated DNA, and uh, identified that in the, in the DNA sequences, there were some small pieces that actually didn't belong to us, didn't belong to the modern humans. It didn't even belong to the Neanderthals or the Denisomans. These yellow pieces um, uh, didn't even belong to the, the colors of change. Um, anyways, um, so, so these yellow pieces uh, uh, did not belong to the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, but they dated back to about the same time when the Neanderthals and Denisovans actually uh, roamed around in um, Europe and parts of uh, Asia. Uh, so what we what we said is that uh, you know these pieces don't belong to any of the three species, uh, us Neanderthals and Denisovans. They must have come from another uh, um, unknown hominin. And we actually published this uh, um, soon after the first Neanderthal complete sequence was published. And uh, you know, I couldn't explain the figure, but uh, that was published uh, uh, by us uh, a few, few years ago. Uh, we then, um, around the same time, there are other people who are also working among tribals of Melanesia. They also found something very similar. They also found DNA sequences among some uh, tribal populations of Melanesia that, uh, from which they concluded that uh, these uh, early Melanesians actually interbred with the mysterious hominid. The mysterious hominid is an unknown hominid whose, um, uh, whose fossil remains have not been found. Uh, we also went ahead and looked at uh, various other populations in Asia in a collaborative mode with other people. Most of these, uh, and, and then uh, we published our study in, um, uh, together collaboratively. Most of the uh, samples from in that study came from India. Uh, and as you can see that they came from India, in, from, from various parts of India and also Pakistan. Uh, we collaborated with groups in Pakistan. Uh, but what is it that I want to tell you today? I won't get into the details of the population structure of Asia or of India. What I do want to tell you is that uh, we estimated the extent of Neanderthal uh, and Denisovan admixture among population groups of India. Uh, so these are various population groups of India. Uh, the, the, the uh, names of the populations have been coded, but doesn't really matter. As you can see that there are, uh, the, overall it varies from about 1.9% to 2.49, 2.5%. So about 2% uh, to 2.5% is the extent of Neanderthal genomes that we carry amongst ourselves, uh, population groups of India. How much of Denisovan um, admixture had happened? Much less. The amount of Denisovan admixture in our genomes, um, uh, or uh, Denisovan genomes in our own genomes in India, is 0 0.8, about 0.1 percent to 0.4 percent. So Denisovan admixture was much smaller than um, than uh, Neanderthal admixture. If you go to uh, in uh, go to the Pacific, it's just the other way around. Neanderthal admixture was uh, much smaller than. Uh, the extent of uh, Denisovan admixture in populations of the Pacific. So there are regional variations, and these regional variations have happened uh, depending on where the uh, Neanderthals or Denisovans were more uh, more prominent, numerically more prominent. Um, I want to end my talk with uh, one uh, question. Again, the question was uh, lurking at the back of our own minds, but it, it was uh, Samantha Pebo and his group who answered this question. Uh, we talked about, uh, we said that there is no, uh, that there's mating between um, uh, Neanderthals and humans. There was mating between Denisovans and humans. We found Denisovan um, the DNA in the human DNA. Uh, but we didn't find human DNA in Denisovan DNA. How, how did that happen? 
So it was, it was uh, initially, there were lots of speculations, but now again, the way that we do it is that we generate data and then we have, uh, you know, competing models. We try and identify which model fits the data best or the data support which model the uh, strongest. So one of the of the several models, and I'm not going to narrate all of the models, of the several models that were propounded, one model was the following, that uh, uh, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, uh, uh, Neanderthals and the humans mated, but the offspring all went with the humans, did not go back to the Neanderthals. So if they did go back to the Neanderthals, then there would be matings between Neanderthals and some of the human genomes would have gotten into the Neanderthal genomes as well. But since the offspring, uh, the model states that the offspring went with the humans, then there would be no possibility of human DNA going back to the Neanderthals. And that particular model was tested multiple times. And uh, as a matter of fact, that's the most parsimonious model that we have as of now that after the interbreeding, after they procreated and offspring were produced, the offspring went with the humans and did not go back to the Neanderthals. The same thing happened with the Denisovans. But the question also remained, did the Denisovans and the Neanderthals interbreed? Uh, it took a long time to, uh, to solve that mystery. Uh, there was not sufficient data. Um, the major uh, impediment was because not many fossil remains of uh, Denisovans have been found. As a matter of fact, uh, as of today, I think the third sequence is uh, third specimen is being sequenced. There are only two available DNA, uh, Denisovan sequences, but over eight thousand Neanderthal sequences. Um, so uh, this was this this is what was found. And again, the uh, ones with the blue shirt are uh, the Neanderthals. The ones with the red shirt are the Denisovans, and the ones with the yellow shirt are the modern um, ancient modern humans. I'm not going to go take you through the entire thing. Uh, I'm only going to point out one particular um, individual here. This individual is 50% uh, Neanderthal, 50% blue, 50% red, which essentially means that this individual is 50% Neanderthal and 50% Denisovan. That can only happen if uh, one is a father and one's a mother and uh, the DNA sequences on the parents are contributed to the offspring. So this can happen if this individual is an offspring of a mating between Denisovan and the Neanderthal. As a matter of fact, they uh, did the analysis of their DNA sequences, and that's the uh, title of their paper, The Genome of the Offspring of a Neanderthal Mother and a Denisovan Father. So how do you know which is the mother and which is the father? Of course, there are paternal, paternally inherited, uh, the Y chromosome and the X chromosome and the mitochondrial genome. They analyzed all of that and were able to identify who was the father and who was the mother. And they identified that the Neanderthal was the mother and the Denisovan was the father. And uh, so we now know that there was free intermixing between all of these three species, Neanderthal, Denisovans, and modern humans. Um, so that, that, that was uh, uh, an extremely uh, important uh, landmark uh, inference in evolutionary uh, biology of humans. And it could not have been done without, uh, you know, the... the uh, great uh, uh, insights and the great contributions um, of this one single man and his team, called the Bantipak Pebo and his team. Later, uh, there's another person who's uh, shot into pr prominence. His name is David Reed. Uh, he's from the MIT Harvard uh, School. I um, want to end this by saying that, you know, I said that, uh, and his uh, Nobel citation also states that it is primarily because of uh, human evolution, but um, he's also contributed to an understanding uh, of um, uh, susceptibility and resistance to diseases in humans uh, in relation to uh, our interbreeding with Neanderthals and Denisovans. Uh, he's given multiple examples of this, and I give you one uh, example that's uh, you know close to us as of now, which is COVID, um, uh, COVID-19. Uh, many of us actually have gotten infected. Uh, came down with COVID-19 um, and, and have survived. Um, many of us did not actually get uh, severe COVID-19 and it was mild and we have survived. Many people got severe COVID-19, some, some survived, some succumbed uh, and passed away. Uh, so there is, uh, there are now studies that have been done uh, looking at, uh, you know, people who were infected and people, uh, who, people who were infected and nearly asymptomatic or mild symptoms versus infected people infected with SARS-CoV-2 and had serious uh, uh, symptoms of COVID-19 um, or uh, had severe uh, COVID-19. 
And uh, genomic studies were done by comparing these two groups of individuals. It's called a case control study usually, uh, where you try to identify whether there are genetic factors involved in predisposition to severe COVID-19. And uh, the, again, this is, I'm not going to be able to tell you the details of the next picture. This is what uh, they had found. And this is the, I'm giving you the punchline first. The, and this is from 70 people's group. Uh, the major genetic risk factor for severe COVID-19 is inherited from the Neanderthals. Uh, the, I'm not going to explain this. All that I'm going to tell you is that uh, these are various uh, um, uh, loci. These are various points on, on the chromosomes that we have. And uh, this, uh, the y-axis is essentially a measure of association with severe COVID-19. And as you can see that there is one spike here, which essentially means that on this particular chromosome, there is a specific position that shows a great association with severe COVID-19. So that is the predisposing factor. So if you have that particular chromosomal, that particular sequence in your uh, chromosome, then you are uh, predisposed or susceptible to severe COVID-19 if you get infected with SARS-CoV-2. The question then came, where did this uh, region come from? Can we identify the history of this genomic region? And they did painstaking work. Uh, Van de Pueblo and his team did painstaking work to identify that this region actually can be traced back to the Neanderthals. So the conclusion was that this particular region that actually provides us with susceptibility to severe COVID-19 was derived from the Neanderthals. He's given us plenty more examples that has to do with human health and disease in relation to our um, you know, um, interbreeding with the, with the Neanderthals and uh, Denisovans that actually resulted in various kinds of genomic uh, por portions from the Neanderthal or Gen Denisovan genomes to come into us. The next question that many of us ask is that if this region uh, was derived from the Neanderthals, and since the Neanderthals actually uh, provided uh, different kinds of admixture, um, different proportions of admixture to human genomes living in modern human genomes living in different places of, in, uh, of the world, uh, where are the most predisposed individuals? Which populations or which regions have the highest frequency of this genomic region? And uh, this is unbelievable. It's, it's very striking. The place that has, uh, is most predisposed to severe COVID-19 is India, as you can see, different populations of India. And we now have data. Uh, to show that this particular genomic region is enriched in many populations of India. The prevalence of this genomic region is very high in multiple populations of India. Uh, I gave this talk not so long ago in ISER, uh, as a matter of fact, day before yesterday to students in ISER, and one student said that, but sir, uh, we don't have data from any other places. Yes, we don't have data. So all of this inferences, like I, I'm saying with, uh, you know, a great, uh, amount of uh, uh, emphasis that uh, the, this particular genomic region is of a very high frequency in India. That's a good statement, but whether it is the highest among all parts of the world, we still do not know because data are still being gathered. But as you can see from this particular graph, that it is uh, fairly high, that we are uh, very highly predisposed to um, uh, getting severe COVID-19 uh, once we have, uh, um, in, once we are infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, let me explain the title of my talk. It must have become clear by now. The title of my talk is We Moved, We Embraced, We Absorbed. We moved out of Africa. I hope that I've been able to give you enough uh, evidence, uh, enough um, uh, you know, idea that we actually evolved in Africa, moved out of Africa. Uh, we met the Neanderthals, Denisovans, and other hominin species whose uh, DNA we still have not been able to isolate and uh, sequence but we met other, our cousins. We embraced them, and not only did we embrace them, we interbred with them. So we have their DNA in us. And like I said, that the most parsimonious model is that we absorb them. Their children, after the children were born out of those matings, the children came with us and did not go back uh, to the other parent. So we moved, we embraced, and we absorbed. Thank you very much. That's the story of human abuse. Thank you. It was really a illuminating talk. There are many talks that 
pretty normal. Uh, and now, uh, I'll invite the audience to ask questions. Uh, the person who is asking a question is actually a long-time collaborator, and she herself has contributed to human evolution. <clears throat> and it's uh, it's really nice that she could come to my talk. Thank you, Shonu. Thank you. Well, there are multiple uh, multiple uh, theories of that of the extinction. One is that. Their numbers continued to dwindle because their children came with the humans. So there would be a demographic decline. That's one theory. We, we never know for sure. The second is, more recently, people have been able to identify uh, around that time there was a severe climate change. So climate change has also been uh, talked about. Whether there was a viral um, infection, I don't know. But that also I've read in uh, places where they have said that it could have been because of a pathogen that exterminated them. But I find that very hard to believe because uh, humans were also living with them and a pathogen that could infect uh, Neanderthals and exterminate them could also infect us and exterminate us. So why did that not happen? So I think this pathogen explanation or hypothesis is, um, is not a tenable hypothesis, but climate change and more importantly, the demographic de decline because children came with us um, is the more, more tenable ones. For me. Uh, you know, India seems to have very different populations, like in terms of you know the demographic. You know, sure. Yeah. Sure. Do you think it came from, uh, uh, <coughs> I mean, how are they so different? Oh, um, you're talking about uh, the the population structure of the modern humans living in India. Yeah, I mean, yeah the, uh, just the time scale is a little different to me. If we talk about that time scale, we had four different kinds of ancestors. Now we have DNA evidence and we have analyzed that data and we can trace back to four different ancestors and the time scale is different. So we are not talking about Neanderthals and Denisovans. We are talking about much uh, more recent ancestors. Uh, probably, you know, 60,000, 70,000 years ago. And here we are talking about um, uh, ancestors that lived about a million years ago. From the Neanderthals, yes, yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that only shows that there is continuity of evolution, for sure. Yes. But that doesn't explain the current population structure. The current population structure is more complex. Sir, how... How is it possible that all of things went with the modern human and not with the Neanderthals or the dinosaurs? Is it possible to share uh, well, all the uh, of things within? Yeah. So uh, the reason why it may have happened, we'll never know that for sure. The reason why it may have happened is that we were also more intelligent. Compared to the Neanderthals, if you take brain size and so on and so forth, there are multiple ways to figure out who... Uh, who are better tool users, who are more intelligent, and so on and so forth. So possibly because of that. But that's only a matter of speculation. Incidentally, this is also a model. If you come up with a better model that fits the data better, then that model will become more parsimonious. As of now, the most parsimonious model is that their children went with the human. This is not to rule out uh, the existence of other possible models. <laughs> How are we separating the, the so what happens uh, is that when uh, the, a large number of these variants accumulate after a certain time, separate species, meaning the distance between the, the, the DNA sequences is, is very large. So if you randomly draw two DNA, two humans and you draw one human and one Neanderthal, the difference between them, the DNA sequences is so large that you wouldn't call them as, you know, uh, members of the same species. That's all there is to it. The When breeding stops is a separate issue. They still interbred, but they're called different species, just because of the differences in the number of nucleotides. <coughs> What sort of relation is there between the genetic diversity and the time and its linear growth or not? Um, a good question. Um, so there are uh, there's been a lot of research on this. If you look at different portions of the DNA, overall, if I was to make a statement, it's linear. 
So the, if you look at uh, you know uh, uh, time versus the number of mutations accumulating, it's very linear. But there are portions of the genome where the accumulation of mutations is much more rapid and non-linear uh, compared to the overall. So. Well, if it more uh, reflects to uh, its uh, non-bearing on natural selection. We can talk about that on the side. Yeah, so if there are, if certain regions of the genome are under pressure of natural uh, selection, so you would not accumulate a lot of mutations there. They uh, evolve linearly, but there are lots of non-coding regions in the human genome. Much of it is regulatory, and there also mutations don't accumulate so fast, but there are some regions where mutations accumulate very fast and in a non-linear fashion. But overall, it's linear. Okay. So there is a question from live. Okay. There is a question, can DNA be linked to the human behavior? There should be some human characteristics that are acquired culturally. Isn't so? Uh, uh, that's the question. Yeah. So I would say that not all human behavior is genetic. There is a lot of acquired human behavior but some of it can be traced back to genes. Some of some um, uh, aspects of human behavior can be traced back to genes. Yes, Another is from YouTube. So, what is the reasons for the extinction of the Neanderthal and Neanderthal? So, I just mentioned. I hope that uh, I've answered that question. The main reason being that uh, demographic decline because the offspring went with the humans. That's the model right now. But there are also other competing theories such as climate change um, and 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 other theories. Okay, so another question is from Facebook Live. The question is, if Neanderthals and Denisovans were different species, how did they mate with um, archaic humans? And because, as for the uh, commenters, he, he said that because the biological definition of the species builder is to produce fertile offspring, did the crossover of Neanderthal DNA happen? Yeah, so, so that used to be the definition of a species when uh, the offspring would be infertile. Uh, that's no longer the definition. And I just answered that question with, in relation to speciation just now. Uh, beyond a certain number of accumulation of mutations, we would call them as different species. They do not necessarily have to, be, have to produce infertile offspring. That's a more modern definition of a species. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? <clears throat> There are, I think, here there are some. I see some hands here. Yeah, just speak up. I can hear you. I'll re repeat your question. Yeah, yeah. Hi. So, uh, I wanted to ask whether if there is any effect of the uh, genome or the Denisovan genome to the very infertility or the thing of the size of the Y chromosome. I do not know that. I do not, do not have an answer to this question, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm sorry. Another question from North Bengal. Uh, one of the live session is going there. So the question is why Pavo uh, sequence the mitochondrial DNA? Uh, his experience. Why did he or did he not? Why he is he, he has used? Why did he? Yeah. That's very natural because DNA is uh, within the nucleus and extra nuclear DNA is mitochondria, which is maternally inherited, passed on from the mother to all her offspring. Uh, there is an added interest to find out sex specific admixtures and sex specific movements. That's why we um, we actually. Uh, sequence of mitochondrial DNA. There's a great interest. I can I can spend another half an hour talking about the mitochondrial DNA. Yeah. Any questions from audience? Uh, there are some questions from here. Yeah, maybe come forward. Tahole to be the uh, what does it mean by uh, listen to your we? Uh, uh, we modern humans. What it means is modern humans, you and I. So actually, I'm trying to say that uh, does it mean uh, human beings all over the world or specific regions? Uh, no. Uh, mm -hmm. 
what it means is that when we evolved as modern humans in africa we came out of africa so we moved we are, by by saying we i'm only mentioning about modern humans the species the modern humans as a whole homo sapiens as a whole Can you can you say beforehand uh, which population is more prone to um, uh, particular disease or do we need the genome of the uh, new virus? As we did for uh, COVID-19, that we, uh, some part, particular population is susceptible to COVID-19. Uh, can we say beforehand uh, that? Uh, if you have identified a genomic region that predisposes you to a particular disease, yeah, then you can look at that particular region, the genomes of individuals, and figure out whether that population is um, susceptible to the disease. We need the genome first. You, you certainly do need the genome. Otherwise, if it's genetic, then you need to identify the genomic region to make an inference. Yes. You may not need to sequence the entire genome, by the way. That's what I meant. Has taken place in yes. My question, my question is: Could it be this? We think this way that uh, offsprings born to Neanderthal mothers and offsprings born to Bushkin uh, mothers, they are genetically different, and that's why offspring belonging to Neanderthal mothers did not survive. So uh, I don't think we have uh, uh, related this to survival at all. Uh, it, what we related th this to is that all offspring survived, but then offspring needs to go with the group, right? Now, whether it, they went with the fathers or with the mothers, we still don't know. That will require much more data. Uh, so it's not related to survival at, at all. It's to which particular group do you then, after your birth, associate yourself with? So it's not related to survival. But whether they, the offspring went with the father's group or with the mother's group, only time will tell. We don't have as much uh, sex-specific data to be able to say that. <clears throat> so one question. Come forward. Come forward. They'll give you the microphone. Yeah. So question. Yeah. Uh, on the so about the COVID-19 susceptibility, so does it mean that genders are immunologically weaker than the other uh, we don't know that. We actually don't know that whether COVID-19, uh, the Neanderthals also succumb to COVID-19 uh, or, uh, you know, to SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. We would not know this. Uh, it's quite possible that uh, they had other kinds of resistance factors um, that, that actually prevented uh, susceptibility or immunological factors. I don't know that. I mean, we don't have data on COVID-19 in Neanderthals. Until we have that, we can't make a claim on any of these uh, answers, questions. So, uh, was there any interesting competition between uh, like what they competed for the survival or, Don't or know. who got extinct first? Uh, no, we, these dates are very, very difficult to pin down, uh, exact dates. Uh, again, both of them 30 to 40,000 years ago. Whether there was interspecific competition, I would speculate yes, but no hard evidence. Is that your question? Is this branch of knowledge uh, uh, medical anthropology? And the question I have that uh, the human types in uh, Andaman and Nicobar are so heavy. Is it only just one specific genomic pattern or they have? No, no, there's a lot of diversity in even in the tribal populations of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Uh, very, they look very dissimilar also. They, they look very dissimilar as well, yes. Uh, the, with respect to your first question, I would rather refrain from you know, categorizing this branch of knowledge to a particular discipline. I think it's very interdisciplinary. This is very statistical, it's very technological, it's very genomic, it uh, involves field work and all of this. So. 
meaning anthropology. So it's a really a combination of various kinds of things. It's best not to uh, try to classify this, this branch of knowledge into one category. OK, so another question is uh, from Light. Is yeah. uh, that whether the DNA, is, remain, DNA remains uh, susceptible to the uh, mutation after the phase of the living species? Oh, <laughs> uh, if you call changes in the DNA after the individual dies, uh, those would, would not be called as mutations. They would be changes in the DNA, but not as a result of other kinds of biological processes that, that are usually responsible. I've mentioned about lots of different chemical changes that take place that leads to changes in the DNA, that leads to removal of lots of alphabets, etc. So you could call them as mutations, but... That's not how a biologist would call them as mutations. They're just changes in the DNA. So there is no correction process? There's no correction process. Of course not. It has to be physiologically active for the correction process to take place. Okay. Uh, as we find people really data, you The Neanderthals had larger brain size than modern humans, but that's probably not true. No, no. The average brain size of Neanderthal was a few cubic centimeters smaller than uh, ours. So it's not so easy to relate uh, just the cubic centimeters of the brain to intelligence or cognitive cognition. Uh, it's not a straight line. It's not linear at all. <laughs> Very difficult. <clears throat> so another interesting question. Uh, why the Europeans are taller? Uh, uh, that is the effect of Neanderthal gene, uh, percentage of the Neanderthal gene is higher there. Uh, percentage of Neanderthal gene is certainly higher there, but whether that segment that contributes to tallness or to height uh, came from the Neanderthals hasn't been figured out yet. I think people have that particular hypothesis and they are looking. So we, <laughs> we may actually find an answer soon. And next question is, uh, why is the Africa uh, that the migration started? Is there any biological reason? Or does it Why is Africa the cradle of evolution, period? Nobody knows. You look at not non-human species, lots of species actually evolved in Africa and again moved out of Africa. Why that happened? Why Africa is uh, you know, so heavenly? One never knows. I don't know. Uh, if the Neanderthal gene is susceptible to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. If the Neanderthal gene is susceptible to the SARS-CoV-2 Theoretically, yes. Yes, it's possible. But how will you infect people? You'll be put behind the bars before you can infect people. So I think it's possible. Honestly, I think it's possible. It's possible to synthesize pieces of DNA that will infect. Yes, absolutely. If there is no question, then I will ask any more questions from audience. Okay, so, so now it is our turn to thank. Oh, thank you so much. Great pleasure. Thank you for coming. We have actually given him a few copies of Breakthrough and the Propriety that he published, the book Science in Ancient India, and also a brief history of science. These are the books that we have given. Uh, now, uh, it is my pleasure to thank all the students and, and faculty members who have come here to at this lecture, not only right here, but also on the net. There is a very large number of people uh, who attended this talk. I would like to, I'd like to uh, thank them. There are two universities in which students and faculty members gathered in halls, and the talk was projected on screen. So it has been uh, done that way in many universities. So I would like to thank them for that initiative also.
and I would like to thank the faculty members of this university for having helped us in the, in the whole uh, in his, and uh, the, the staff who have helped us in organizing this thing. Thank you very much.